<laughs> I'm not advertising for them, they're not even paying me for doing that, but they do find them very helpful. <coughs> well, I suppose a lot of water has gone under many bridges since last we met together. And one of the questions which I have been frequently asked by several folks um, What is God doing in Northern Ireland? What is God doing in your life? What is God doing in my life? And sometimes it would appear as if God is almost <coughs> stripping you bare. Back to the bare necessities of life. But sometimes we cry out, we say, well, what are you doing? Why? Not wrong to ask, by the way. The Lord Jesus Christ himself asked the question, why? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But that's not our subject this evening. Just a little introduction I want to give you, because it's a thought which has been in my mind now, I come across quotations from time to time and little sayings and I put them all together in a little book so try and write little things off them. What is God's objective for your life and mine in these days in which we live in all of Ireland? I am always delighted to hear John Goodwin saying it for the word and well although the Lord isn't here because that's not something which we hear very often today probably. People forget that the Lord is coming. They think they're going to live another 40, 50, 10, 100 years or maybe. There isn't that length of span left in this world either spiritually or ecologically, that's a big word for what goes on all around the place, or morally even. There isn't, we, we are really living in difficult days, dark days, but there's still a, a light which is shining in that country of the country. What's God's purpose for you and I? And I'm going to leave with you a little thought which I normally would leave at the end of a meeting, but I feel I'll leave it with you before we commence. I believe that in God wants to wipe out in each of us all of the traces of the fall. All of the traces of the fall. And it's his purpose to eliminate everything from my life, from your life, from our lives, which brands us or marks us as members of an old exile race. If you and I are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are this afternoon, this evening, we are marked. We are branded. We belong to Christ. He paid the price. Forgive our sin. Give us that wonderful gift of redemption. Never underestimate it. Never underappreciate it. And always look to what the Lord is doing. Sometimes it feels almost as if God is really stripping you down. So that the old mortality sometimes, you wonder, are we ever going to get through? And what he's doing, he's taking away from us everything which would mark us or brand us as being what we once were in Adam from our birth. And replace it with what we are in Christ. And if that's something which you hold in your mind, hold in your thoughts, it may help you. It helps me at times. And I sometimes sit there and think, well, what are you doing? And I sometimes say, in that still and small voice, Brian, you need to get out of that there. That old mark of the Garden of Eden, you need to get out of that. I need to replace it with something which I want to do. God is faithful. God cannot deny himself. You and I are his children. He won't put us through the mill or the mangle, as we sometimes would call it, these stuff has, just because he's a God who glories him. No, he does it because he wants sometimes to remove something and replace it with something better. And he's always working in us and always working for us and always working through us so that everything will be for that. Let me take a scripture reading just very briefly. I think I did cover a fair bit in the beginning of the introduction of chapter 2 of the book of Philippians, but I'm going to just read it without, with very little comment when I'm going to read us Philippians chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 5 through. And Paul is giving the little church of Philippians a 
Philip or other, the antidote. I said, we're for anxiety. And the antidote is humility. And of course, there was that famous passage, which I think we spent a fair bit of time on. And it led to a lot of questions, which I think I sought to answer some of. Didn't answer them freely. We'll go a little recall, a little recap tonight. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Who subsisted, being in the form of God. The form of God, spirit of being, invisible to the naked eye, couldn't be seen by you. Thought it not something to be grasped at, your version would say robbery. Thought it not something to be grasped at, to be held on to, that he wasn't going to give up. To be equal with God, the co equality of the Lord Jesus Christ of God. Is God, was God, and always will be God. But made, now look at this, himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. So we have the spirit being the form of God. He takes upon himself the form of a servant, humanity. So we now have the dual nature of the Lord Jesus, we have him in the form of God, that's his deity, and now we have him in the form of a servant, the form of a bond servant, that's his humanity. We now have a person that we're told we're going to imitate, that we've got to let the mind off be in us, who's now got two natures. We looked at that last time, the dual nature of the Lord Jesus was made in the likeness of men, and being found, in other word means found upon examination, and after examination, you know how the Lord Jesus Christ for the, perhaps the, the vast part of the first 30 of his earthly years, and particularly the last three of his earthly years, was always under investigation. Headquarters of, of the Church of Jerusalem, headquarters of, I'm sorry, not the Church of Jerusalem, headquarters of, of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all those other other isms that were all around, always were sending out parties, go and see what he's saying, go and see what he's doing, see what he reports back, and such things, being found in fact as man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, <coughs> even the death of the cross. And when the little church at Philippi would hear that little word, even the death of the cross, a little, a little thought would come to their mind. Because the death of the cross was something that was reserved for slaves, for vagabonds, for criminals. If you've done something wrong, you're crucified. It wasn't for God. It wasn't for the Pharisees. It wasn't for the Sadducees. Even the death of the cross. Did he just say that this woman he wants to imitate, this God and this God person, died the death of the cross? Yes, he did. And in light of that, when you come into verse 9, Wherefore, God also hath highly, the word is super, highly, hyper, exalted him, and given him a name, the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, that's heavenly, things on earth, that's earthly, and things under the earth, that's infernal, we call it. And that every tongue should publicly confess the Jesus Christ Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now I'm only going to do a short recall of that. And then he comes into where he wants us to go. Wherefore, and wherefore as you're well taught is always wherefore or therefore you need to look at what is therefore and what is wherefore. Therefore and wherefore my beloved. He's writing the Philippians. This assembly as you've always obeyed not as in my being alongside or my presence with you only, but now much more in my absence or my being away from you to put in the original Greek. Cultivate. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I know the order here. This is assembly work. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless, unblameable, 
and harmless means uncorrupted or unmixed. The sons of God, the children of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, all around you, perversity, all around you, carnality, all around you, people that were citizens of the Roman Empire, they were down in Philippi, they came there because they served the Roman government, they maybe did two or three campaigns in a war, they retired from the army, the Roman government said that if you want a wee piece of land down in Philippi, take it, build a house on it, take a wee garden, grow your own crops, do all those things, but don't pay any tax, well, of course I would go down, I would you not, tax, can't wait to get away from it, that's exactly the problem, the profile that there was in Philippi, and Paul says that they were never, you see this crooked and perverse generation amongst you live, amongst whom you move, amongst whom are your next door neighbours, you're not to like them, you're not to imitate them, you're not to follow them, but you're to shine as lights. The word is very strong with luminaries. It's where you get it in Genesis when God placed the great lights in the sky, the sun and the moon and then the stars. And heavenly lights is the exact word. Holding forth the word of light that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not on one being or neighbor living. Now we get that. We'll get a little overview. We're going back a little bit because I want them to look at just a few aspects of the Lord's death. And to leave with you a few thoughts on them and then come properly into the passage. You see, there are people who have mixed views on the Lord's death. Some will tell you that it was this. Some will tell you that it was the other. The Lord Jesus was unique in his person. Was unique in his death. It was an unparalleled death. Because it was the death of a sinless person. The Bible teaches very clearly, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Death is the product of sin, James 1.15. The Lord Jesus has no sin. So there's no wages to receive, nor has he produced or could he produce anything sinful. So every day, from the moment he was born, from the womb, the womb of Mary, right through until the very moment of his death, he never had one sin of his own, never a sinful thought, never had to say sorry to his mother, never had to apologize to the next door neighbor for falling down with him. You think about that. An absolutely was holding an impeccable life. Not didn't sin as some people will teach you today, but couldn't sin. There is a vast difference, my friend. That's what's called the impeccability of Christ. Some people will teach you today, well, the Lord Jesus Christ decided not to sin. That's an impossibility. The Lord Jesus couldn't have sinned and didn't sin. But the purpose of this incarnation was that when the Lord Jesus Christ, through death, this death that's talked about here, the death of the cross, that he would put out of action the one being who had been instrumental in bringing death into the human race. That was Satan. And it's not our subject for this evening, but at the time of the Lord's death, there was an unparalleled spiritual conflict going on between the forces of good, represented by the Lord Jesus Christ, and the forces of evil, headed up by Satan. That when you come to the death of the cross, there were things happening on the cross in the death of the Lord Jesus, which made it completely unique and unparalleled that no one has ever had to repeat, no one ever would be able to repeat, and no one ever shall be able to repeat. And I want to leave you just a few things for those, and then bring us properly into the passage if I can. First thing I want to leave you this is it was a divine judgment. It was a judgment that he bore on my behalf, because my sins deserved eternal death. Your sins deserve eternal death. Our sins deserve eternal death. But this was a judgment deserved by those that he came to save. Because God made him to be the sin offering, as it were. Some people will say in the Bible, God made Christ to be sin for us. That's not right. God cannot make Christ to be sin. Christ can't sin. So he makes him to be the sin offering on our behalf. <coughs> excuse me, for our sins. So this was a divine judgment. This is a divine judgment of God punishing Christ on our behalf, in our place. My dear brother and sister, if you lose sight of everything else in life, do not lose sight of this one thing which keeps me going through dark days and dark nights and bright days and bright nights. Christ Jesus loved me and gave himself for me 
and died on Calvary's center tree to set me free, that no matter how many fingers or pointers of accusation come my way from the accuser of the brethren, who hasn't given up on being the accuser of the brethren, by the way, still will point the finger at you and I as well. He can, and as often as he can every day, you're not worthy, you can't have forgiven. That can't be, you can't, you thought that, you did that. That's all part and parcel of the spiritual battle that you have to have your armor on for. But Christ willingly came and took the divine judgment for my sin. Number one was a divine judgment. Number two, it was a satanic attack. I'm sure that we read scripture, we always read it consistently and consecutively and continually, and we come across little verses that we read so often and they pass us by and we think, oh yeah, I've probably read that 500 times, never thought about that. If you go back and we'll take our minds just for a wee minute back into John 13, it says there, the devil having put it into the heart of Judas to betray him, and then it says that the devil entered into Judas. Well, that was all a fulfillment of what had been promised way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when there would be a battle between the royal seed and the seed of the serpent, etc., etc. But it was a divine judgment. It was a satanic attack. This was the confrontation of good and evil of such proportion which will never, I suggest to you, ever have to be met again in this world. I hope not. Because if we need someone else to represent us at such an aspect of this divine judgment, we haven't got anybody else. It's already been done. So be very careful what you see people enacting or what you see people reducing or reproducing or telling you, listen, my dear brother and sister, the work of redemption is done. Plans of Satan will be fulfilled. Does that mean that Satan gives up on you and I and say, I'm not bothered to have God anymore? No, it does not. In fact, very often, the further you try to further yourself in on God's word and God's work, you find yourself already sitting very much explained. The third aspect of his death, it was a cruel and wicked murder. Why? Because there were so many people initiated it. So many people who were involved in it. First of all, it was initiated by Judas. And then it was accomplished in the Jewish hierarchy and the people. But then it was given to the benefit of the Gentiles. And when you come to the cross, you have all these parties of people that were all there, all collectively putting, as it were, their, their sixpence were. And eventually, when you come into Matthew 27, you nation of Israel, and they accept responsibility. But it was a cruel and wicked death. There were so many people, so many parties all represented. But I want to look at this just finally as a little aspect of the Lord's death, even the death of the cross. That it was a voluntarily self sacrifice. Remember that. I hate to see pictures of the puny Lord Jesus still suffering on the cross. I hate it with passion. You know where it comes from. You know what I mean without putting it onto any um, net or whatever it may be. I hate to see that picture of the Lord with still bearing the crown of thorns and and still having, as it were, wings and half naked on the cross. That could not be further from the truth of today. In fact, it's blasphemous. Because a dead Christ is no good to you and I. We need a living Christ in our lives today. He said this, no one can take my life from me. And no one could take his life from me. Impossible. And when we come through the scriptures, you'll find that there were three times on three occasions when persons took up the stones to kill him, but they couldn't. And then they tried to cast him over a hill, tried to cast him over a hill, rather, and he passed through them. Why? Because until his hour, his hour, not your hour, not our hour, his hour was coming. They were powerless to touch him. Why? Because he had God's overruling protection. Thing. You see in the garden, he takes the initiative. He approaches his enemies. They don't need their lamps, they don't need their torches, they don't need their swords. He comes in John 18 and he says, Who are you looking for? And they said, We're looking for the, 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 the Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And he says, Here I am. Not on the wrong there. Not running away from it, but uniquely meeting it in his voluntarily self sacrificial death. And then, of course, when we come into the moment of his death, I want to be very gentle here. Must remember this: we see pictures of people, and, and you know, their head drops on a pillow and they're away. 
The picture which is painted in the Greek of the Lord Jesus Christ is the bad thing you're saying. It's the same little picture which is used in Greek of someone resting their head upon a pillow when they lie down at the end of hard day's work. They put their head down. Because the work's done. They don't fall down. They don't slap down. They bow down. They remain in control. He remained in control. He dismissed the spirit. Doesn't die with a cry of weakness or a cry of pity, but with a loud voice, he actually dismisses his own spirit. So those are four things I want to leave with you. First of all, this that God's holy justice or holy requirements of justice. The requirements of God's holy justice was that someone has to pay. We sometimes sing that song. Sometimes I pray that prayer. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And I sing this brand new song, Amazing Grace, the Holy Ghost, you know it so well. But the divine holy requirements of justice and respect of sin were completely and totally met by his death. You remember that. Because if you have never experienced it in your short life, you've experienced it in your long life, sitting, sitting with your tail, something saying, you couldn't be forgiven. That thought that you have had, that word that you have thought, that thing that you were even planning, you're telling me that that's forgotten. Gone. Not to be gone, but already gone. Why? Because they were all met through this death. Satan was, as it were, we would call it today, effectively defeated. <coughs> now sometimes, friends, it's hard to understand that because there are times when many of us have times in our life and we feel as if he's sitting on our very tail, sitting on our shore, sitting almost as it were the seat of his I don't understand those things. Why does God permit them? But as regards having any power, he's effectively defeated. Let me give you a little example of this. You see, people talk today about, and I didn't intend to do this, but I'll do this for you a really short one. People talk today about demonic possession. I believe in demonic possession. I have seen demonic possession. I have dealt with them. And I haven't dealt with it personally. I have seen it in my former realm of employment. I think that might be the best way of putting it when you've got someone who's been really, really demonically possessed. I haven't seen it much, but I've seen it. But I've never seen a believer. I have seen a believer demonically oppressed. There's a vast difference between oppression and possession. Because demonic possession, the being is in absolute control of the person. Demonic oppression, it's as if someone is oppressed in your own being, squashing you, but they can't beat you. They can't control you. You still have the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's on our subject this evening. But the cross man's work in this was at its very worst on display. And fourthly, on the cross, in the death of the Lord Jesus, God's love in Christ shone forth in a way that no other way could. That's why Paul could say, even the death of the cross. I will recall if I can. There are many questions that come out of teaching, like such as what we've read talk through last time and a few other times. Some of those questions that were asked were, were the temptations real? I think I can tell you answer of this. Could God die? No. God cannot die. Jesus died. God didn't die. Jesus is God's son. And we need to be very careful when we bring in lineage like that and, 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 and teaching like that. There are lines of demarcation and that we want that we want to say, etc. etc. So what I want to do is I want to tie, try and tie in if I can where we have came to that little point and, and we looked last time that in verse 9, God also had highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. And there was a little play on that. I think I did that with you last time on the little word name. If I haven't, will you correct me? Did I give you the teaching on the word name? Or the... Right, okay, okay. I, I apologise. I thought I had. Well, let me, let me do it with you very quickly now. And I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> when God took the Lord Jesus... And by his act of his power, 
as it were, to simplify this, went down, and if God had a family, God doesn't have a family, okay? Jesus has a family. The Father doesn't. But if it were, he went into where the Lord Jesus Christ was lying in the tomb for those three days and three nights. And in one act, one movement, lifted him out of the tomb, right up, up through all the, 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 the realms of heavens, the heavens and the heaven of heavens, and supremely exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. Now, the fact that the Philippians would hear that little word, the name, I suggest to you would, would draw something to them. Because what we have here is in verses, uh, let me see where that verse is, in verse 9 also down through is this. There's a contrast here between Christ's complete and absolute super humiliation. Here's what he did. Verses 68 is what Christ did. He regarded he, he himself as nothing. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. And then when you come to verses 9 through to 11, it's a description of the results of what he did then, what God did. So we have the being of Christ, and he has humiliated himself and went down in the death, even the death of the cross, dealt with all those things. Now God takes over, as it were. And God, some people say there's seven steps down in the Lord's humiliation, and there's seven steps upwards in his humiliation. There is, but in Greek it's one completed word. And here's the Greek that way that I was I hadn't intended to do it, but I'll give you this as a legit exam because I did think about it earlier on. I thought, well, how about this? I get this. See, uh, this evening I got ready and I went to the stomach and I got down on my knees and I prayed and then I got up and I read the Bible and then I went up and I got washed and then I got dressed and then I got ready and then I drove down the country road and I came, and I came here and I came here. And you're saying to me, that's a lot of movement. Me saying Greek, that's one movement. That's just called the AORS tense. One movement. But there's many parts in that, isn't there? There's many movements. Are you with me? Please say yes. Yes. There's many parts in that. But I agree that's only one movement. So in the time when God took, as it were, the Lord Jesus up, ascended, resurrected, ascended, exalted, and enthroned him, in Greek, that's one movement. That's what's called the Aorist Tense. It's a thing which happened in the past. And it has complete eternal consequences, never to happen again. That's exactly what this word is. So from the grave, right up to the resurrection, up to the throne of God by right hand, where he bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, it's one word. In other words, it means this, that God graced Christ with a name. Now that to you doesn't mean much. That to you and I, when we look at this, think about or thought about a name doesn't mean very much. It says, God has bestowed this name upon this risen and exalted Jesus to show one thing. Unequivocally, that means without fear, without fear, or without doubt, to the nation of Israel and to you and I, that he is God in the flesh. Right? You see, when you come to the, old, the New Testament, you find there, Thou shalt call this name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And you and I say, yes, well, his name was Jesus. But Jesus was quite a common name. Yeshua, Yahshua, Yahweh, all those connotations. Now that doesn't mean to say there was others running about that had the name Jesus, but there were others that had similar names as it were. Now we have to differentiate between the Lord Jesus and Jesus. And how do we do that? Well then we see what God the Father did on his behalf. Because what we find is when we go into the Old Testament that people use a name uh, as a label to identify people. My mother didn't know what to do. So she said, we'll just call him Brian. That's my name. That's my identification. <laughs> when people ring me, they say, is that you, Brian? Yeah. But that's our thought in a name. That's how we use names. In Greek, a name was used to reveal the character of a person. That's where we start to come into the understanding of the little word name. Now, I'm going to take a few moments to this. Because if you get this, you've really got a lovely thought in the passage. There are people who take names today, and they take the Lord's name in vain. I'm not doing that, but you know what I mean. It's very common. It's something that whenever I worked in, in, in the old youth justice system that you deserve, you'd have heard the Lord's name taken in vain thousands of times every minute of every day. And after a while, I have to be honest, I had to stop personalizing it because I stood my head and what do you know you're talking about? People 
and with whom when they said, Jesus, this, Jesus, that's so Christ, that's so Christ, that. Father Muhammad today is this. That you people are going to take the name Muhammad. Buddha? Confucius? Allah? Mary? And then I exalt those persons who hold those names up to wonderful, revered positions. And they have the audacity to put Jesus alongside him. His name doesn't belong there. He has got a name which is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, not the ordinary name, he shall call his name Jesus for the same as people who said, not that just his earthly name. But you see all those people who will call those, you know, who follow those or followers of Confucius or Buddha or Allah or whatever it may be, they don't reject, they, they refuse to acknowledge the Lord Jesus as God. But a day is coming, my friend. A day is coming which is as sure as the nose is on your face and the skin is on your body tonight. When every one of them and every one of us, in virtue of the name, the honour of Jesus, will bow the knee. The knees that have bowed the idols today will in a coming day bow the name to Jesus. Why? Because all the knees are going to be getting together. Now look at those three locations, okay? We're not going to go much further in the Philippines. We'll look at these three locations. Paul talks here about a heavenly location. That's above the earth. Well, who's above the earth? Some of you may say, well, that's, that's heavenly. Okay? Could I make a suggestion that's the angelic being? That's the heavenly realm. The heavenly realm is where the angels live. And then we have the earthly realm, and that's on the earth. That's the human realm. But then we have another thing which is mentioned here that he, he says with the name of Jesus, every knee should buy things in heaven, the heavenly realm, things on earth, the earthly realm, things under the earth. That's the demonic realm. You and I know very little about that, but thankfully so. But my friend, there's living here, and there's dead here. There's saved here, and there's lost here. There's angels here, and there's demons here. And the day is coming when all together will publicly acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. We do it tonight willingly. They will do it someday, ultimately. I don't know how. But the reason why Paul, I suggest you in this little passage, puts in this, I'm going to do this with you as a little thought. If you go to, you can do it if you want, in Genesis chapter 11, uh, verse 4, you have that lovely Old Testament story. And you have the nations of it as they have come out from, from the ark and they have replenished the earth, or are supposed to replenish the earth, and God has told Ham, Shem, and Japheth, Noah and his wife, go out, replenish the earth. And of course you know that again there were intermarriage and those things, and then eventually they came to, they were all living in the, in the plain of Shinar at the Tower of Babel, and they said this, let us make a name for ourselves. A name for ourselves. Why does man want that? Man wants his political self-importance. That's a result of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. He wants to have a name for himself. You don't need to be a very much reading the press today to find out there are people who are only interested in their own name. They want to have a name for themselves. And that's Genesis chapter 11. But if you go in later on in that chapter, you'll find there that God comes down. We believe it's the person of the Lord Jesus, what's called the Christophany. It's an Old Testament pre-incarnate, pre-birth appearance of the Lord Jesus in, humanly for, in human form. And he says, no, this will not do. So what does he do? God sends confusion and suddenly, my, my dear friend here who's speaking Japanese, he's speaking Hebrew. And then suddenly down the back, um, Lisa, Lisa's speaking fluent Portuguese and someone over here speaking fluent Chinese. The problem is they don't understand each other. So what do they do? Well, Lisa takes her group, forgive me Lisa, I'm sure you can help me later on, and she takes her group and they go, where do they live? They speak French, they live in France. <coughs> and suddenly Paul, he takes his group and they speak fluent Japanese, <coughs> they go to the word Japanese. So suddenly God gets what? He gets his own way. What was his original plan? Replenish the whole earth. But then we come to the next chapter. And we come into Genesis chapter 12. Now here of 11, we have God in response to man, let's make a name for ourselves. God says no, and confines the languages and scatters them abroad. 
One committed Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and we have here, and the Lord had spoken unto Abraham and said unto him, Get thee out from thy country and from thy kindred into a land, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy That's the story of the name of Scripture. Now that's a wee word for That's the best I can do. But God says, I'm the one who makes a name great. And you see, when you go back to the days of Paul readiness, you've got to remember there's a contrast comes out of this passage quite frequently. And it's a contrast between what we would call, if you were looking at it from a historical point of view, what was called imperial propaganda. Imperial propaganda was this. Caesar is Lord. You came to the little pagan temple in the middle of Philippi. You were out for a nice evening. You thought, okay, I better go in here. And there's a little fire burning. And you do all your rituals. And you come to the front. And there's a little dish just sitting at the side of the altar. And you take a little pinch. It looks like salt. And you little pinch of it that you take. And you throw it in the fire. And the fire goes like a 12th of July. And the 11th of July all comes full bonkers. And you say this, Caesar is Lord. It's incense. Here's the problem. You're saved. Caesar's not your Lord. The one who's got a name which is higher than any other name is your Lord. That's where Paul is bringing these people to <coughs> contrast between imperial propaganda and Christianity. And I wish we were sometimes back to this type of teaching again today that there's a vast difference between what goes on in mainstream church Christianity which puts the label upon Christians as everybody who comes to church and puts five pound in an envelope once a year and those who really follow God I wish we could go back then I'm not here to criticize anybody but I'm going to tell you something we need to narrow the tracks a little bit I am far from a narrow minded person but we need to narrow the tracks because not only on coming day is every day going to bow but every tongue is going to confess the Lord Jesus Christ confess me to declare openly in acknowledgement of who he is. And one day, my dear friends, Paul is ready to remind this little church, all the ends of the earth will openly acknowledge that he is the one true God. That keeps me going. That lifts my soul in days when I don't know what to do. That lifts my soul in days when I think, is it is Satan winning this battle? Are we losing our soul? Are we losing our life? Are we losing our way? Why are we not seeing things done the way they used to be? I don't mean done like we wore our shirts and you know we didn't chew chain dogs and go to the cinema and do all things. You know, we didn't chew chew dogs anyway. You know, all those things. I'm just talking about getting the good old glory of the gospel and then getting the same place all day. You see, in the Lord Jesus Christ, I noticed this in his earthly ministry, in that earthly path of humiliation, all he ever wanted to do was to glorify the Father. I find reading through the scriptures, that's a but that's his one task. That's his mission. And if that's his mission, surely that should be ours. How do you do that by standing at the corner of Valley Southern Street and yelling at the top of your voice? No, it's not. That may suit some people. That wouldn't be me. That's not me. And then you notice when you go through the scriptures that after the exalted, after the exaltation of the Lord Jesus, after his death and burial and resurrection. Mm -hmm. That for the first part of his life before his death, he is glorified the Father. We you know what happens now? The Father glorifies him. And that's really what Paul is saying here. Therefore, in light of what Christ has done, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, and he gives you all the credentials of that. And he says, You see that now? You never live in you. And you see if you do, and you humble yourself before God, then that's your acknowledgement of his lordship, which one day ultimately everyone in this world. With this little quotation, we'll finish for this evening because I, I said that I would finish a few minutes earlier because I'm looking forward to the apple part and the chocolate cake and those things. You know, I haven't had one day to tell you the quick this. I haven't had one. <clears throat> the once despised and rejected Lord Jesus has such freedom and has such renown. You must remember, my friends, read the scriptures. That every time that the Lord Jesus came in confrontation, direct confrontation with the demonic power, what did they say? We know you who you are. Are you come to destroy us before the time? Are you come to judge us before the time which would be the ultimate judgment of all things? 
And every time you find demonic power and his deity confronting one another, let's go to the story of the widow of Nain. You have death coming out of the city, you have the Lord Jesus coming to the city. Right? They then became the city. Who wins? Well, death can't win. Why? Because Christ has conquered death. And every time you see that, that ultimately every created being will one day have to bow before him and confess his lordship. And when an assembled universe, which will involve billions and billions of beings, spiritual and supernatural, demonic and angelic, whether they do it with a glad willingness, I don't know, or whether they do it under some sort of compulsion, all will be, all will be, all will be for the glory of God the Father. Because that's the supreme aim of Scripture. That's to be the supreme aim of my life. Not to please my wife, that's hard to do, isn't it, okay? Well, no, give her beer, don't tell her, said that. But you know what I mean? What we are meant to do in our lives is simply what Paul said to do everything to make sure that it brings glory to God. It may be in the small, minutiae, it may be in the house, it may be just something that you're doing in your life, but as long as it pleases God, that's all that matters. It doesn't have to please the man next door or the street or around the corner or down the road. It has to please him. And how do I know what that is? Well, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God and took upon himself the form of man and humbled himself, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And because of that, because of what he did, look what God has done. God has exalted him and given him the name. And that little study of the name, I hope will be a little enlightenment of what Paul means when he throws in the focus. Now, as you go through the rest of the study, we put the chapter 2 properly next week, you'll find Paul using things like that. He to use little pointers from the Old Testament. Because remember, a lot of the people he was writing to would be familiar with the Old Testament. And not all, not all. There were people that came from all sorts of pagan backgrounds. But can you imagine being there with that letter read out and you're saying, I'm giving him the name. Caesar's not the name my brother. Caesar hasn't got a name, we're more Caesar today. We don't even know. And we come to worship the living <coughs> and true God. Let's pray. Mm-hmm. Father, we want to thank you for the for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for these moments, precious moments that we have spent in recalling just some of what we've we've all sought to learn from by word tonight. And we pray, Lord, that as we go through our earthly journey, you'll help us to remember, Lord, that when it feels almost as if all has been stripped away and stripped bare, that really, Lord, all you're doing is presenting us and producing Christ within us. Help us to bow to that, Lord. Help us to be obedient to that. Help us to remember that that obedience brings blessing. For some tonight, Lord, when there's difficulties ahead, you know the way, you know the path, and I pray your hand of blessing upon in Jesus' name.